Hello and welcome to our YouTube studio here at the Munich Security Conference and I'm very happy today to be joined by the Vice President of the European Commission and European Commissioner for promoting the European way of life. Welcome, Margaritis Schinas. Thank you for having me. You are welcome and we are happy to have you uh, today with us. And when I read the sentence, promoting the European way of life, I wanted to know what are the values that you are promoting? It is pretty simple. Um, in the European Union, we are 27 democracies. The rights of minorities are protected. The role of women in the family, in society and in the workplace guaranteed. We are the world champions of human rights, of data protection. We have universal systems for health and education, open to all. We take care of our elderly and we have no death penalty. Mm -hmm. Bits and pieces of this you can find in other parts of the world. All this together, it's called the European way of life. It only exists in Europe. And um, you, also when I read that on your website, you write, it's Europe that protects, must also stand up for justice and for the EU, EU core values. So these are the values you're you're mentioning. Absolutely. We, we, I, I, my role in the Commission is to coordinate the Commission work in two families of issues. First mm -hmm. is what we call the Europe that protects, mm -hmm. which is migration, security and health. And the other family of issues is a Europe of opportunities and mobility, education, culture, sport, youth, skills. It's a unique uh, job because it obliges us to fertilize the work that we do across different strands of work in a global way, not, not in a fragmented, isolated way. And what are the challenges you're having? Because you mentioned values. This would be the best case scenario when they are there. But you also have very concrete challenges. What are they according to your point of view? Well, uh, the main challenge on the Europe that protects side is, of course, the fact that uh, as a union, we still have not managed to find a European agreement on a, on a migration and asylum policy. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, made proposals two years ago, uh, but we still lack this agreement between our member states. So that obliges us to work on migration as firefighters running from crisis to crisis and we want to become architects of, of a, of a fine. harmonized, fine European solution. So that's, that's the main difficulty we have. On the opportunity side, I think we are doing well because um, especially younger generations of Europeans aspire to this uh, model of life that is a bit of Erasmus, mobility, open society, open borders. This is a big European success. Within the European Union. Within the European Union. Exactly. But that's, that's, that was not given for our fathers and grandfathers. That was not always like that. So we should see it today and not for something for granted, but something that was achieved. Absolutely. So you're, you're talking about within the borders in Europe. When we look outside the borders, you mentioned migration and you mentioned human rights. So when I look to the, to the Greek um, island, um, to the camps like Moria, or today after two, two, uh, two years it's Moria 2.0, the so-called Moria 2.0. Why is there, according to human rights activists, not the same human rights approach that we have within Europe? And this is also European ground. Yeah, I think uh, this is changing too, uh, and it's changing uh, in a way which is spectacular. I, I, you refer to uh, the situation 1516, which did not uh, honor the European Union, our values and our standards. Mm -hmm. uh, now, at the time, we have 60,000 people in the Greek islands. Now we have less than 4,000. So we tried, and we, with the help of the Greek government and, and the other member states, we tried to find solutions. And now, in all Greek islands, we are finalizing uh, new facilities fully uh, compatible with our European values and principles, totally financed by the European Union budget. And I would invite you uh, uh, one, one moment, if you have the time, to go together to see for yourself that uh, there is no Morias anymore 
in our external border. I've been there, but not the last months, but I've been there um, and I'm in contact with people who are living in these camps and they are um, saying that it's a very bad situation for them. According to different organizations, human rights organizations, it's also they are criticizing the human situation that they are living in, in the, in the new camp. And I mean, you know it, very concrete examples. So people sometimes ask, when, especially when I talk to people who are, um, who are fleeing from their countries or who are living in these camps, they ask, are the values of uh, human rights, equality, supporting a minority, are they for the EU citizens or are they for human and for humanity who are living also in Europe? Because that's sometimes the contradiction which is happening according to their point of view. No, 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 I, I perfectly see this point and I want to be very clear with you. The, the, the basic premise of uh, our migration policy is that Europe mm -hmm. will continue to be an asylum destination for those who flee war, persecution, dictatorship. Yeah. This is what defines us as Europeans. This is why we are Europeans. There is no doubt that this will continue to be the case. But wow. at the same time, those who have no legal reason to be in Europe, those who are not under the protection of our laws, they have to go back. And this is the only way that we have a policy that is acceptable. Otherwise, it will not be. And it's not always easy, it's not always nice, but uh, our migration policy has to have these two components. Yeah, but if, if I look today for a very concrete example, if I read today The Guardian, mm -hmm. and they have been in doing an investigation with other media outlets, and they were talking about the fact with the pushback, mm -hmm. that according to what they find out, and they investigated the two, Two uh, uh, people were pushed back, um, and they uh, and they died because of that of the pushback policy. How do you see when? And you know it. They are criticizing it. People are being pushed back just not to arrive the borders, our borders in Europe. This is very clear. I want to be very clear too. Uh, pushbacks are illegal. They are not allowed. They are illegal under international law, and they are illegal under European. EU law. So th there is no any discussion about whether this is uh, an acceptable practice. Now, uh, there are allegations that uh, are being reported from time to time. We have uh, demanded that all these allegations are investigated by independent bodies in each member state where these allegations uh, are formulated, mm -hmm. uh, not by the governments themselves, but by independent bodies that have the opportunity and the occasion to to investigate uh, deeply, and um, we will not uh, accept these practices. These are illegal and are not compatible with uh, our way of life. But uh, according to the human rights organization, they are still happening, and you're aware of that. <coughs> and then is also, um, there's a kind of narrative or a strategy that um, it's being told and it's happening, which is keep people for a better life in their countries, people who are let's say from Afghanistan, from Libya, from Syria, from Iraq, they are not coming to Europe where we say keep them in their countries because they have challenges, it's, they are not in a the democracy, living in a democracy. So how this should happen to people like them and if we want to protect people and human rights and humanity? I disagree with the, with, with the verb that you use. You say keep them there. I would formulate it differently. There is nothing wrong for Europe helping countries of origin and transit to provide for better lives for their citizens. It is fully legitimate that countries of origin and transit offer better prospects to their people. And if this needs support from Europe, we're ready to do it. This is not uh, bad. This is, this is the, the normal. People should have better lives where they are born. They should aspire to have decent living and, and form families and, and, and take care of their parents. That's how it, it has to be. Mm -hmm. Now, um, of course, this does not entail that Europe should subdelegate 
to third countries the responsibility for migration. That's a totally different thing. But in my view, it's much better for, for a young Afghan to have a better life in Afghanistan with the help of Europe instead of putting his life in the hands of the smugglers in, in, in the Mediterranean, for example. But if we see at Afghanistan as a concrete example that putting his life in the, in the hands of the Taliban is, is also not a solution. Absolutely. That's why when I said that Europe has a duty uh, to help uh, countries of origin and transit provide for better lives for their citizens, this would also mean addressing the root causes of migration, not simply signing checks, uh, but uh, being a force of good. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in Afghanistan now the problem is that uh, the Taliban regime is, is not yet recognized, but... Uh, this not is yet, you're saying? You, you think it might happen? I think that uh, we, we need to be able to help people close to where they live, we have to make a difference in the countries of origin and transit. And we hope that even the Taliban regime at some point in time would, would, would seek and the benefits of international cooperation. This could be uh, discussed in hours, this topic. So we go to our next topic because uh, of time, the Russian-Ukraine conflict. What's your main concern? My main concern is that... Um, our model of society, the one that uh, pacified Europe after the Second World War and the fall of Berlin Wall, where we live in peace and prosperity and tolerance, uh, is a model that is successful mm -hmm. and is now being exported. And as it comes closer to Russia, I think this is what the Russians really do not like. I, I see this not as a security threat per se, but I see it as the natural consequence of our model of democracy reaching the gates of a country which is not yet democratic. And I hope that at the end of the day, or at some point in time, the biggest guarantee for a safe continent would be a democratic Russia as well. How to reach that? Yes, how to reach that? That's, that's a good question. But, uh, you know, um, the same argument could have been formulated for Central and Eastern Europe in, in after many years of totalitarianism and, and, and dictatorship. Mm -hmm. But it reached them, these countries. So uh, the same argument would have been said about Ukraine. But Ukraine is now democratic, peaceful and independent. So in, at least in my uh, big picture view of things, uh, and in a rather optimistic view of things, I still think that uh, a democratic Russia yes. would be possible at some point in time. It might take a lot of time, and if we look at now and, and, and today, and what you've been saying today, the press were uh, um, uh, quoting you that escalation of, uh, of Ukraine conflict potentially might lead to displacement, according to estimates between 20,000 and maybe 1 million people could be displaced by the conflict. Uh, so my question <coughs> is, what are you doing? What are the kinds of preparations you're taking today as the European Union to prevent more problems and to help at the right time? I do not want to over-dramatize the situation of what might happen if uh, we reach the, the war scenario and we have an impact on migration, but we have clearly to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And um, we are doing this. We are, we are preparing. Uh, and in a way, uh, what happened last August uh, in the management of the Afghani, Afghanistan crisis is also uh, a useful experience for us because we now know what type of scenarios okay. would be called to, to sort out evacuating EU citizens, people who were uh, working with us. So we, we now know what, what it takes. But it wasn't the best scenario. We know this. There were a lot of challenges. We saw the pictures of people fleeing, falling down from the airplanes. It's not, it's not the best no. way of humanity. But, but, and that's why my concrete <coughs> question is, what are you preparing? What concrete steps are you doing? We are preparing for procedures mm -hmm. that would allow us very quickly, when we detect uh, uh, a major impact on migration, to be able to help on the ground. Um, this entails EU 
citizens and nationals living in Ukraine, but also we should not forget that in Ukraine there is a sizable number of, of uh, refugee uh, population, migrants, that would also uh, have to Lee. be taken care of and they would like to live. There also, you should not forget that we had the Belarus uh, crisis uh, recently yes. where we saw that some of these people would have been instrumentalized to attack. So we are preparing uh, the European Union against all these possible scenarios with our member states to be ready if the situation warrants for it. Do you think a war will happen? I personally think that war will not happen. Because in, in Europe, one of the nice things that we achieved is that our children do not even know what war means anymore. Because we, we, we live in a continent that for 70 years uh, there was not a single shot to be fired. So uh, a war uh, in, in the current context, uh, it's not an option, I think. What could be more credible as, as an outcome would be a, a protracted crisis with uh, topical uh, events and incidents, mm -hmm. with continuous cyber attacks, things like that, that are different. It's another type of war, but not war as our uh, fathers and grandfathers knew it. Um, you're optimistic. It looks you're, you're, you're optimistic. I'm a born optimist, optimist. and okay. I must say that uh, uh, it served me well so far. You mentioned a cyber attack, and I know one of your priorities topic, or you're talking about, you talked yesterday about, uh, uh, there was the special event innovation at the Munich Security Conference about cyber crime and cyber security. Mm -hmm. What do you exactly mean with the challenges you're facing because of cyber crime as cyber security? Can you explain it to me in a very simple way in order to understand it? Because it's just a big name or a phrase. Yeah. Uh, Cyber security uh, is the defense against aggressive tactics, mm -hmm. mainly state-sponsored, but not always, but mostly state-sponsored. You were smiling a bit. Do you have someone in mind? <laughs> well, I think we have the same usual suspects. <laughs> I know. I, 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 I'm, I'm just asking. <laughs> but uh, the the the. Uh, so you didn't you, tell, you have someone in mind. Well, I have the same people who you, you have in mind. I didn't <laughs> think about anyone. <laughs> but on, on a serious note, be it state-sponsored or not, mm. uh, the characteristic of these cyber attacks is that they target our systems, not our defenses, not our national defenses, but our systems, our health system, our banking system, our critical infrastructures. Why? because these are targets linked to our daily lives, mm -hmm. but also because in these areas in Europe, we have a tremendous amount of data. So if you attack a health system, you not only attack those who take care of our health, but you also harvest data that are massively stored in hospitals and healthcare systems. So these are the attackers. That's what they want to do to sort of cripple our defenses, affect our daily lives. And we are now, uh, the, I like to say that the era of innocence for Europe is over. Now we know and we are getting increasingly better to fend off these attacks. Did this already happen uh, uh, for the Ukrainian and uh, Russian conflict? Yes. It happened? It happened and it happened recently. Uh, what was it? days ago it was a a coordinated attack uh, at the uh, information systems, at the websites of the main ministries of, of, of Ukraine, but also to different public utilities. Mm -hmm. And when this happens, uh, there is no doubt that this is a coordinated uh, attack. So you also see um, there is a need to react and uh, to coordinate between the different 27 members of the European Union. How you want to do this? Like every country has their own security system, their own uh, um, um, uh, cyber system. How you want to achieve this? Is this realistic? Yes, it's realistic and it's happening already. And um, 
we are improving, we are getting better every, every, all the time. Also as a result of these continuous attacks and crises, because these also have a pedagogical effect, they sharpen our, our defenses and our tools. First, it happens through a regulatory, uh, mm -hmm. legal uh, procedure. We are changing our laws, our legal software. Is there one of the countries that are saying, no, we don't want, no. we have our own system, there's no trust. We, ha we know that the European yeah. Union today is not unified and saying like we are one, true, true. one union. The, the difficulty is not that much that uh, they do not want to cooperate. The difficulty is that the point of departure is very unequal. Okay. We have uh, digital champions and digital tigers and others, and, and others who are not. So our, our legal effort is to create a legal framework that covers everybody. Mm -hmm. The second uh, line of defense is operational capacity to fight back, to, to rebut, okay. to uh, not to be a sitting duck against these attacks. Uh, first to detect where they're coming from and then shield and, and shoot back. And the third line uh, of European action is we will never be able to do it alone. We need to work, to work with like-minded uh, partners, with mm -hmm. our American friends, with NATO, with uh, Canada, you know. Th there is an element of uh, Western values which is at stake, and we need to work with all these people together. Thank you so much. That's it? It's over? Th that's it. We, r we run out of time. I think we could sit for the next one hour and talk and talk. Uh, for your optimism and uh, answering all the questions, and uh, we're looking forward that you Join us next year again, and then, as I told you, we can have the picture then here from today. So thank you for uh, joining us and uh, being you. with us uh, today. Thank, thank you, you so, much. so much. I was very much impressed of your knowledge of, of all the details of my portfolio. Thank well you. done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.